Hello there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Today's guest is uh, Dr. Martin Jean, who is Professor of Organ and Director of the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. Professor Jean has performed widely throughout the United States and Europe and is known for his wide repertorial interests. He was awarded first place at the International Grand Prix de Chartres in 1986 and in 1992 at the National Young Artists Competition in Organ Performance. A student of Robert Glasgow, in the fall of 1999, he spent a sabbatical with Harald Vogel in North Germany. He has performed on four continents and in nearly all 50 states. In 2001, he presented a cycle of the complete organ works of Bach at Yale and his compact discs of the Seven Last Words of Christ by Charles Tournemir and the complete six symphonies of Louis Vierne both recorded in Wulsi Hall, have been released by Loft Recordings. Recordings of the organ symphonies and stations of the Cross of Marcel Dupré are forthcoming on the Delos label. Professor Jean is on the board of directors of Lutheran Music Program. He earned his doctorate from the University of Michigan. In this conversation, Professor Martin Jean shares his insights on what it takes to lead the next generation of uh, church music leaders in the 21st century. Let's go to the show. So, thank you so much, Professor Martin Jean, for doing this interview. I'm so delighted. We're sitting here at the uh, Coffee Inn. That's a place to, to get coffee in Vilnius with Professor Martin Jean from Yale University, Osha, my wife, and myself. And uh, Professor Martin Chin is visiting Vilnius with uh, many of his, uh, or some, I should say, some of his students from Yale uh, Institute of Sacred Music uh, on a European organ study trip that they're doing this year in the Baltic countries, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And uh, luckily, they visited Vilnius and uh, our church, St. John's Church, also, and played. And Belis Vaitkus, our good friend and uh, colleague, gave a seminar on uh, romantic and uh, baroque organ music there. So some of the students from Yale re- really touched this instrument and uh, could, could, uh, had a g- good practice experience. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Martin Jean, Pleasure. for doing this, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Excellent. So, uh, did you touch the organ yourself also? A little bit, a little but bit. only as the wind was dying away. <laughs> I, <laughs> right. could, I could still feel the resistance. So, uh, from judging from students' experience and where you weren't uh, downstairs to listen in the nave, how do you find this organ? This is a beautiful uh, instrument, uh, yeah, kind of a neoclassic uh, arrangement, uh, and of course the the best stop on the instrument is the acoustic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, saying to you earlier, I think that maybe in the United States there's three or four churches that possibly rival the acoustic here at St. John's. It's beautiful. It's uh, treacherous for certain kind of polyphonic music, but uh, I think it works very well for the organ. Right, and of course tomorrow you will see completely different setting, completely different uh, acoustics, and uh, completely different instrument in a small village church in in um, in uh, Tituvene, right? Tituvene. Uh, it's yeah. a monastery church. Uh, yeah. It has two manuals without pedals. Yes. And uh, but but it's a Lithuanian style, and you will get to play some rock. Uh, Manuality pieces, right? We uh, we arranged this, I think, also in Lithuanian style because uh, I was uh, sitting with one of your colleagues uh, this morning over coffee, and he says you should go to this church, and I said, well, it's, it's on our way to Ugala in uh, in Latvia. How can we do it? And he took out his mobile phone and called his contact there in uh, Tituvana, and uh, and immediately we have an appointment. 
Fantastic. Yeah. Lucky coincidences, uh, right? And uh, and your trip is more more expanded. And uh, I think your students will be delighted to see this this particular not organ bench, but uh, organ special seat, just like we're facing here. But it's a baroque <laughs> style seat uh, because there is no need for bench there because there is no pedal board. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes right. sense. Fantastic. So I think. Uh, Tomorrow will be a special day for the entire organ department there. So, uh, uh, so Martin, is, it's very curious um, how people first fall in love with the organ. Do you remember those early days in your childhood? Uh, who, who was the person who introduced you to this magnificent instrument? My childhood was a long, long time ago, but in the mists of my memory, I recall sitting in my church, of course, I grew up Lutheran, and I loved singing the hymns with my family, with our congregation, and of course it was the organ that was leading the hymn singing. Uh -huh. And uh, for me it was the most important uh, part of the service, was hearing the organ introduce the hymn, to lead the hymn, to uh, encourage people's singing of the hymn. And uh, that's probably the thing that got me most excited. I will confess, however, that I made my parents uh, sit near the organist, uh, whom you could see from our seats in the church. Uh, and I also liked how he pushed and pulled all of the buttons. I thought they were buttons, of course, for stops. I was very fascinated by that as well. Fantastic. We were talking about uh, your childhood experiences, right? Everybody is sort of uh, vaguely remembers that instant, the this, this special person who introduced to this special instrument. Uh, maybe some people even remember the, the smell of that first instrument, the environment. Was it a day or evening? What kind of environment was that? Remember my well, I'm afraid it was not a glorious environment. This was an American church, cinder block walls, and uh, and it was a a Hammond electronic organ. Mm -hmm. uh, where our church couldn't afford a pipe organ at the time, um, but we did eventually. The church built a new building attached, and uh, there was a new instrument um, for that space. And the, the, my memory there was of all the low notes that would make the, the seats in the church rumble. I could feel it in my body. And, uh, and uh, that made me even more excited about the instrument. Fantastic. So from, from Hammond to recording all, all uh, symphonies by Louis Vierne, right? <laughs> it's quite a way, right? So what happened in the middle? Uh, well, I discovered France first of all, and that was largely due to my teacher at the University of Michigan, who was Robert Glasgow, who during his lifetime probably had the most thoughtful insights into this repertoire. From Franck through Messiaen, he was com completely committed to the French symphonic school, and Given my Lutheran classical Germanic background, uh, I found that this tonal world opened up whole new vistas for me. And I, I remember having a few years of um, disinterest in, in the music of Bach, in fact, which I, of course, you know, embarrassed about now. But I was so overwhelmed by the sonic world of, uh, of France, and, uh, and you know, eventually I would go to visit, I competed, and I uh, uh, played many concerts there, and fell in love with the people, and the food, and the cheese, and the wine, and so on, as one does, and discovered quite quickly that this is all part of one large cultural picture. And of course, the famous Chartres organ competition, right? Yes, back mm -hmm. in the early Paleolithic era of my life. Right. <laughs> that uh, made your, your organ career probably uh, a big kick, basically, right? It, it was a boost, certainly. Boost, yeah. And uh, it was, you know, it was cer certainly professionally a, a good, a great experience. 
but personally, it was even a stronger uh, experience. Uh, Pierre Fermentido, who was president and founder of that competition, and Colette Morion, and Lynn Davis, and all the people who were involved to make that festival and competition a success, I found to be such kind, thoughtful, generous people who were looking for ways to encourage organ playing uh, in young people. And we were all taken up in this project, whether you took first or second or third place or whatever, uh, we all felt very much encouraged and, uh, and supported in what was otherwise a, an incredibly nerve-wracking experience. Well, of course, uh, that was quite quite long time ago, and the situation in organ world was quite different, I think, because uh, this kind of competition, the large competition, can really boost your career in those days. But now there are literally tens of uh, similar uh, size competitions, and uh, many more organists competing for the same spot in, in the organ sphere, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, do you think that today your, for example, organ students at Yale uh, face a dif different situation than yourself when you started? Well, different situation, I, I suppose. Um, we're, uh, you know, we, we work to train them to be the best possible mm -hmm. musicians they can be, but I think that's not the end of the story. It can't be the end of the story for uh, an organist. In our institute, we have an, uh, our institute is committed to sacred music, uh, not only as its own standalone um, cultural entity, but as, as a part of a fabric of um, theological and liturgical and religious discourse. And our job is to put them in touch with that larger intellectual, social cultural, religious, spiritual world, um, and I think that puts them in a uh, pretty good um, condition to work in, in, in the world that they care so much about. Fantastic, and these organ study trips, of course, uh, uh, have a big part in educating uh, your students, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have this first-hand experience with historical organs, European organs, right? Mm -hmm. Which sometimes are different beasts altogether from, mm -hmm. from what, you, what probably people are used most in America. So, uh, so it's interesting, how many students, how big is the, the uh, Yale Institute of Sacred Music? The Institute of Sacred Music has 65 students, mm -hmm. uh, 15 full-time faculty, about 7 regular part-time faculty. We have a, a project that brings 7 or 8 visiting scholars from all over the world, and then we have a staff of about 12. So altogether it's about 110, 120 uh, people. Uh, and of those students, uh, 12 of our students are doing graduate work mm -hmm. in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of this makes uh, Institute of Sacred Music, I would say, the leading force in, in not only in North America, but probably in, in the entire uh, uh, Western Hemisphere uh, in the sacred music field, right? Uh, those uh, experts and students, uh, you get, uh, get the best of the best, probably, in one situation. Well, we're, we're certainly very fortunate to get wonderful students that are both wonderful uh, performers with strong musical backgrounds, but they're, they're intelligent, curious, and care about many mm -hmm. things. They're mm -hmm. not only c concerned about their own personal career, but they're concerned about the world in which they'll work uh, one day. Fantastic. Uh, we got to witness their, uh, their skills in organ playing firsthand on this St. John's organs today. And I'm curious, uh, um, what is the selection process at Yale? Um, how do you choose the best of the best, basically? <laughs> what is uh, your, your angle, right, uh, that they have to have uh, in order to be admitted uh, into sacred music? Well, it's, a two, it's not atypical of any American university. It's a two-round process. They submit uh, a recording of their playing mm -hmm. along with um, a 
of course, all their academic work, and we have to see a, a sample of their writing because we care about how they think. Mm -hmm. And then we we take usually we have you know 35 applicants all together, just in Oregon, maybe 40, and then we take from that about 15 people, 15 to 20 people, and we those people will have to come to campus and do another round of playing. Mm -hmm. It's always better that they choose different repertoires so we can see a, a wide range of skills. And then during this live audition, we interview them and get to know them as people and thinkers and get to know understand their career uh, ambitions. And we test for other musical skills as well. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we invite... Usually it's five or six, on average, six people uh, a year because we have a, a lock on these 12, mm -hmm. 12 organ, organ uh, positions. So when you have this comprehensive uh, selection process, of course you get uh, the most motivated, the most curious, the most uh, um, probably, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, probably the most... Uh, the most, let's say, uh, I will repeat it again. Uh, when you have such a uh, such a uh, comprehensive selection process, uh, you get to choose from really the best people in, in this profession, right? The, the leaders in the in the future of organ playing and sacred organ playing. So probably graduate graduates from from Yale Sacred Music Institute will will be. Uh, leaders in their field in North America probably and not only in America. We, uh, we've had very good luck uh, with our students finding good positions in mm -hmm. large churches or conservatories or cathedrals or people that sort of combine teaching and mm -hmm. work in churches. Um, I'm very proud of where, what they've been able mm -hmm. to contribute. And um, is is the, your work in sacred music field uh, at Yale um, uh, geared towards one particular uh, religious uh, tradition, or you encompass broader uh, range of Christian denominations? Well, I mean, you hit on one one uh, term there. It's our our program is primarily in Christian studies, though not only. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the, the, our graduate students in music are by and large working in sort of the Western Europe, Euro-American arts music canon. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, those who are work going, looking toward working for religious communities are generally working toward um, Christian uh, communities. We, have, we certainly have Jewish students. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hard pressed to think of students who are currently working in synagogues, for example, though I'm probably overlooking a few. Um, and then within the Christian communion, we, our students, work for a variety. Mm -hmm. Yes, I suppose mostly Roman Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran, Presbyterian, those churches, uh, some uh, United Church of Christ, Congregationalist, uh, those mainline churches that value organs, choirs, singing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, art music, because that's largely what we do, though not only. And of course, uh, uh, musical traditions in, in the Christian, uh, Christian uh, denominations uh, around the world uh, are basically very fluid. Sometimes they fluctuate from more, uh, more uh, traditional way to more, sure. let's say, contemporary practices yes. and back and forth sometimes. Yeah. How do you... How do you uh, uh, basically accommodate uh, those trends in your curriculum? That's an excellent question. Um, we're, in, as far as our graduate students in music go, they are getting their degree from the Yale School of Music. Mm -hmm. and, and the Yale School of Music is one of our two primary partners, the other being Yale Divinity School. Um, and the, uh, for our graduate students in music, they are following a course in organ, choral conducting, or singing. And the singing is primarily early music, oratorio, and leader. So the, our first job is to be sure that they are up to snuff on those one of those three disciplines. 
they have to be very good coming in and they have to be even better going out. And that, of course, uh, for us implies a very rigorous conservatory style training. Uh, they're taking music history and music theory and all the repertoire courses. Our organ students are taking improvisation and, uh, and uh, courses to teach them how to play in the liturgy, etc. Um, and then many of them also take courses in theology and liturgy so that they're understanding the less larger <laughs> spiritual content. Um, but uh, and at the same time, uh, there are many opportunities to expose them to a variety of different forms of liturgical music. Uh, for example, one of the most important and uh, most rich uh, sources uh, is our uh, Divinity School Chapel, where many, are, many of our musicians make the music. Uh, the Divinity School is a Christian ecumenical divinity school, which has uh, somewhere over 40 Christian traditions and also non-Christian traditions represented. Uh, several different kind of Baptists, several different kind of Lutherans, etc., etc., etc. And uh, the the chapel, which meets at the center of that community's life every single day that classes are in session, has to accommodate and make room for all of these of these different religious expressions. And that's of course liturgical modes and musical modes as well. So. We have an immense variety of musical sounds that are made in that in that chapel as a context of prayer, uh, and certainly those include uh, traditional European American hymns, um, but uh, and it also includes uh, liturgical music from around the world. Uh, I think the term we use is global hymnody. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the best uh, term in the world, but that's that's the the Nomer at the moment. Um, we have uh, students who are quite skilled in contemporary popular uh, vernacular uh, forms of Christian music um, in jazz styles, in rock styles, in folk styles. And, uh, and the, the team that runs this chapel is very skilled at, in a sense, um, exposing students, including our music students, to all of the all of these different modes of, of worship. We think that's very important. Fantastic, fantastic um, expertise you are giving to your students. A while ago, uh, Martin, you mentioned that uh, your students uh, also take classes in theology. I think uh, that's crucial part of uh, uh, of uh, church musicians' um, uh, career because uh, then they can really communicate with clergy. Right. Yes. Uh, on on uh, equal terms, right? Uh, whenever you see a problem uh, rising in organist position, uh, salary cut, for example, or uh, some misunderstanding of, of what an organist does from the clergy point of view, and you as an organist want to uh, communicate with the clergy, the only probably wise thing to do is to have a, 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 a really understanding how they feel, how they are educated, and it really helps for the students to have a good grasp of theology. It's true, and they're not just taking those theology courses by themselves, they're mm -hmm. taking them with future pastors. Okay. So they're, uh, in a sense, they're growing together um, as uh, in a kind of an educational team. Uh, I won't make the claim that it's easy for anyone because ultimately they they are they're taught much earlier than when we get hold of them they're taught different languages and different modes of expression but um, trying to knit them together in this uh, in this curricular way is uh, is the best way we know how to uh, help prepare them for the real world. And there is of course another side of the coin uh, that future clergy, future future um, few, uh, spiritual leaders could have a good grasp of musical understanding, yes, right? Yes, of course. Uh, it's absolutely critical that, and we feel that this is a core mission. If we weren't making this music and the music that we are primarily uh, expert in that uh, there would be no way for the future 
clergy that come out of Yale University to be exposed to that. Mm -hmm. So as I remember Dr. Quentin Faulkner taught, telling us that in any given church, uh, organist and, uh, and the pastor or the priest is, uh, are the two m most highly educated people in the parish, yeah. in, the, in, the, in their congregation. Uh, and um, and uh, therefore they have to have a way to talk to uh, with, with, with uh, one sure. another, a common 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 language. Uh, and uh, if if your future clergymen uh, or clergywomen probably uh, have a good understanding of musical ideas, right, mm -hmm. which which are in the church music, and future organists have good grasp of theology. Then I think uh, good uh, understanding of each other is is uh, is in front of them, and uh, future career uh, of the organist might be much much more secure. I was I was thinking about this very thing as we were touring around many these many churches, um, thinking back to the day when, for example, in the early generations of uh, Lutheran Church, the cantor of the church and the pastor of the church received exactly the same university education, mm -hmm. side by side. The cantor would uh, uh, would also know music, of course, but the, the clergy would know music because they grew up with it in, in the home. Maybe this is, uh, I'm telling a more or less idealized story, mm -hmm. but uh, but I think uh, it's it's true, for example, of the cantor in books to his church. Mm -hmm. He was had the exact education as the pastor, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that we've lost along the way. Mm -hmm. Not not only that, of course, but we, we lost the, the way that clergy were raised from childhood in, in music, because music is not an important part of, the, of home life in many, uh, at least in many American homes. And if we think uh, about uh, music making in the church uh, in a broader sense, if we count back uh, hundreds of years backwards in the future, in the, in the past, right, uh, the first mus musicians in the church were clergy, cl cl clergy right? Yeah, they were bro ministers. Brothers in, in, brothers, in right, monastic, monastic communities. The, the cantor, the librarian in, in uh, uh, also, as I understand it, who fulfilled both roles sometimes, was the, the most educated person in a monastic community as well. And that's the person, uh, he or she, who knew the, who knew the music. But of course the times change and uh, the music got more advanced and advanced and advanced. So the clergy sort of uh, did their thing and musicians started to do more of their thing, right? Performing and composing music. Mm -hmm. And there, that's where their paths start to uh, defer and... Uh, one, one could say that uh, in a way the advent of the organ or the, the uh, intrusion of the organ into the Christian liturgy <laughs> was uh, uh, helped sort of build the wall between musician and clergy because it was it was a machine that required so much technical expertise that uh, the training of that person uh, was absorbed in that art and mm -hmm. not the larger intellectual. That's of course I'm oversimplifying uh, things, but uh, the um, the idea of the of the hidden organist up there in the gallery, behind hidden behind the book positive, making magic in this uh, massive machine, uh, must have uh, been a completely absorbing occupation for that person. And you are so right. And I just remembered the, the words of Marcel Dupré saying that organist in church is merely tolerated. Because uh, without the organist, the liturgy couldn't really go on. Because the choir would uh, continue the, the role of music making in the church without the organist. Mm. So whatever uh, function the organist takes in the church, whatever preludes and postludes and toccatas is playing, mm. it's, it's merely tolera toleration of, 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 of basically his activities or her activities. And uh, organists have to be mindful of that, not to try to show off their virtuosic skills probably mm. Too, mm. Too, too often or too much but uh, think about how they blend into the liturgy and it's it's important that we're all partners in this act of prayer mm -hmm. and that has to be the the priority from my point of view mm -hmm. 
so fantastic, uh, um, Martin. Uh, I think uh, you are leading the next generation of uh, sacred music specialists in the right direction. Uh, I'm not the one to tell, of course, but uh, I think uh, they will forge their own paths, of course, uh, as they graduate and go into the life and uh, get their own uh, expertise and uh, feeling of where do they want to go next, right? They'll, they'll all create their answers, and they, they don't all sound like mine, uh, thank God. Um, but they all, they all uh, we're trying to give them skills first so they can ask the questions and then search for the answers later. And it's so different world now. It's such a different world from, from let's say, even 70 years ago, after Second World War, for example, in America, organ was such a, on the rise, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Even uh, uh, theological seminaries, the future priests and pastors had to play organ. Did you know that? Yes. In many cases. In my tradition, uh, Lutheran tradition, it right. was part of the seminary curriculum to right. play piano and organ. Yeah. Of course, in some of those uh, cases, those um, itinerant pastors were alone in a country church and there was nobody else to make the music. Mm -hmm. And uh, so somebody had to do it and they were trained to, to, to be the, the, the fallback solution. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's good when your clergy person knows how to... Uh, work his or her way around the keyboard. <laughs> so, so tomorrow you will meet uh, another clergy, uh, clergyman, Janis Kalnich, who is actually ordained a Lutheran pastor. Is he? He's, he is, yes. And uh, oh. also he is an organ builder. Yeah. So he combines both things and he does play the, the organ yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And uh, he, when he tries out his instruments, he, he knows what he's talking about. But plus he, he, uh, he, um, he is really a minister. And he, he has a parish in this church in Ugale, and he leads the spiritual life as well as musical life. All oh, right, I didn't right. know that. I'm glad to know it now, though. So fantastic uh, yeah. trip, I think, is waiting for you tomorrow. I look forward to it. And thank you so much for being so generous about your ideas and time. Pleasure. I think people around the world, uh, lovers of organ music, and... Um, uh, from about 89 countries now wow. will listen to our conversation and uh, uh, will get uh, will get more good glimpse into what it takes to lead uh, sacred music uh, into the 21st century great so martin before we close uh, this conversation can you give our listeners a link uh, where they can find you and your work online. Our our institute is at ism.yale.edu. ISM is for Institute of Sacred Music, Yale, Y-A-L-E, dot edu. Fantastic. I will make sure I will include this link into the description of, of this conversation, this podcast. So thanks so much one more time. Have a wonderful, creative year and good health. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog Secrets of Organ Playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you online really soon.